Good morning, everyone, and a very warm welcome to our worship service this morning. Whether you're from Muir or Relief, you follow our page, or you are visiting us for the first time, we hope you feel very much a part of the family of our congregations today. As you can see, part of our worship service this morning will take place in the sanctuary of the Muir, and this is a first step in our journey back towards regular worship together. So, intimations to follow later on in the service, but let's begin our worship today, as we always do, with a hymn. Let's come together now before God in prayer. Let us pray. Lord, we rejoice that the light of your love is shining upon us, and it does so in all its radiant beauty from the face of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Saviour and Redeemer. We rejoice that he leads us to a Father who is a generous provider for all our needs, who guides our feet in the paths of peace, who watches over us and cares for us with a love that is never ending and which will carry us into his eternal presence. We rejoice that Jesus leads us to his cross where he dies for all our sins and where our past is wiped clean and where we are equipped for the life he calls us to lead. We rejoice that he leads us to his side where we are befriended with the one who is the friend of sinners and who is their saviour and redeemer and who we praise and rejoice in today. We rejoice that he leads us into the world of his spirit, 
where he mysteriously comes to live within us and to inspire, equip and enliven us and to make us aware of the reality of God with us. That presence and power which brings redemption, change, joy, hope and delight. That presence which brings strength, certainty and the confidence to take on evil and to know that we shall prevail. Lord, this day, re-equip us for service. Make us good soldiers and servants of Christ, dedicated to our master, pledging our loyalty and love, and living to glorify his holy name. We ask it for his sake, who taught us when we pray to say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, good morning, children. Lovely to see you again. Got a wee story for you this morning about a wee girl called Molly who went to visit her granny one day. Now, Molly was one of those wee girls who was always doing something. She was full of energy. She ran about. She went out the garden. She came back in. Her granny was trying to cook. She couldn't get a minute's peace. So her granny thought, I know what I'll do. I'll teach you how to knit, Molly. Oh, she thought, okay then. So our granny got her some lovely red wool, some really big knitting needles, and she started to knit. In, over, through, and out, our granny said, that's the pattern. So she said, that's fine, I'll do it. So she sat and she did in, over, through, and out, in, over, through, and out, and it was growing quite quickly. And for the first inch or so, it was really good because she just kept doing what her granny had told her to do. But then, being Molly, she got very fed up. She thought, oh, this is quite boring. In over through now, I'm sure there must be another way of doing this. So she thought, I'll experiment a little bit. And she did. And she experimented that well that I'm afraid it ended up looking a bit like this, which is actually not the pattern at all. And at that moment, once she realised what she'd done, she heard her granny calling her and she said, Molly, have you been knitting? Oh, yes, said Molly, I most certainly have. And have you stuck to the pattern, said her granny? Well, she said, I've nearly stuck to the pattern. Oh, dear. Because when you're on a pattern, nearly is actually not good enough. Because it ends up like that. And there are a lot of patterns in life. And when you're at school, the teacher says, what does two and two make? Now, you know that the answer's four. Because it's always four. It can't actually be anything else. But if you put your hand up and say five, you find everybody's laughing. Because it doesn't happen like that. And if you're doing your alphabet, A, B, C, D... What if you were going to go A, B, X, P, F? That doesn't work because that's not the pattern. Now there's another pattern and it's very, very important. And that's the pattern that God has for your life. And that applies to grown-ups too. Now this is a great pattern. It takes into account all the things you're good at. It takes into account all the things you're not so good at. Because nobody's good at everything. Well, I'm not anyway. And I don't know if anybody else is, really. It takes account of all this. And it's a pathway for you to walk your life on. It's a pattern which, if you stick with it, it works out very well. Sometimes you wonder which way you're going. But if you just keep going, you'll find out. And at times, actually, on this pattern and this pathway that God has for you. You might feel, oh, this is a bit boring. I think I'll try a pattern of my own. Well, often, like Molly, trying a pattern of your own ends up looking a bit like that. 
but there's only one thing to do when that happens. Say to God, oh, I'm sorry. Do you know something? I'm never going to do that again because I don't like what's happened there. And he'll help you get back in the path. Now, Molly's granny was a very wise woman. And being presented with a piece of knitting like that, she might have said, oh, for goodness sake, Molly, what have you done? But she thought, no, time for a lesson in life. She said, well, you haven't stuck to the pattern, have you? No, said Molly, and look at the mess I've made. Her granny said, there's only one thing to do, Molly. We must put it behind us. We must pick up our stitches and we must knit on. And that's what she did. Only this time, she did stick to the pattern. And of course, in the end, we can patch those holes up and we've got a whole good piece knitted in pattern. And that's what we're thinking about today. The pattern of your life. What are you going to be when you grow up? Well, we don't know yet. But all the foundations of it are being laid right at this moment. And this is the time of your life where following the pattern is very, very important because of what it's going to lead on to. And that's our story for today. And next time, in about a couple of weeks' time, I'm going to tell you the story of a pair of socks who fell out with each other. The right sock couldn't get on with the left. The left sock couldn't get on with the right. Shocking. Remember and listen in and find out what happened when that happened. So, until the next time, we'll say bye-bye and thank you for being good and listening and being very attentive. And keep knitting but keep knitting the pattern. Bye-bye. Bye. Good morning. And today's reading comes from Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 to 14. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossus, grace and peace to you from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints, the faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven and that you all have already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. All over the world this gospel is bearing fruit and growing, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all its truth. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. This will sound odd, but I once described myself as an accidental fruit grower. We'd moved to a house in Ayr which had three plum trees. Some years they would produce basketfuls of fruit, other years none. Some years I couldn't give away enough plums, other years I'd none to give. I simply had no idea what would make these fruit trees consistently fruitful. To be fruitful is not just the quest of fruit growers, but also it ought to be that of Christians. We're talking spiritual fruit. And in my life, I find inconsistency there too. John Wesley's concern 
was that there be fruitfulness in those who applied to be preachers like himself. He asked this odd sounding question, have they fruit? He was not asking whether they were good plum peach or pear growers, he was asking about their spiritual lives. In other words, could those who were seeking ordination show anything for their service? Was there at least one person who'd found faith through their preaching? Was there a single person whose spiritual life had been enlivened by what they had taught? Also, and very practically, was any hungry person fed? Was any homeless person given shelter? Was there any sign that the ministry exercised by this person was waking the world to the dream of God? Have they fruit? That's a great question for would-be preachers. Do you know, I was rarely asked that question before or during my 40 years of ministry. I really wish somebody had. I might have felt that a rocket was put up my backside. Thankfully, I dare to believe my 40 years have not been wasted. I can point to some whose lives have been changed, to people who become good preachers, ministers of many different kinds, and even evangelists. Although I do believe my years could have been a lot more fruitful. What most Kirk ministers of my generation lacked, and this is going to sound a bit like an excuse, was encouragement, especially to be more fruitful. Then it was sink or swim, with no coaching. Thankfully, things are changing. Have they fruit? Now that's also not a bad question for congregations to ask themselves. Imagine the discussion that would take place at a meeting called to answer that particular question. Imagine if all were asked, which lives have been changed? Who has come into the church as a result of our outreach? Who is serving now who was just an observer before, a kind of pew filler? Are our people making any difference to their neighbourhoods? Is the church just taking up space in a corner of the town and causing a parking problem for Sunday shoppers? I can imagine a lively scene as a church tries to answer the question, have they fruit? The church in Colossae to which Paul wrote had earned a reputation as the kind of place that bore good fruit. Paul wrote, we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints. And he goes on, just as the gospel is bearing fruit and growing in the whole world, so it has been bearing fruit among yourselves from the day you heard it. So if the question was asked of the Colossians, have they fruit? The answer would be a resounding and enthusiastic yes. That's the challenge for all Christians and all churches. If we are to match the faithfulness of the Colossians, if we are to keep bearing fruit that is valuable for the communities we serve, then we must continually ask the fruit question. Because we can easily become fruitless. Imagine a church which, year after year, has had no new folk coming to faith. Is it just a waste of space? It needs to go through a process of rigorous pruning before it will bear fruit. And that applies to individuals too. Two questions that stuck with me are these. When did you last share your faith? And when did you last try? Have they fruit? But while John Wesley asked, have they fruit? General Booth asked his would-be Salvation Army recruits, have they love? Some of his young recruits were becoming discouraged at the lack of results from their efforts. Booth didn't seem to sympathise. He just said, try love. That reminds me of the song, Love Changes Everything. 
But Paul ranks love as the greatest of virtues in life. The Colossian Christians were known for their love too. In fact, the whole early church was first known for its love. See how they love one another was the exclamation of the onlookers. Ah, but we're a reserved lot in Scotland, aren't we? You often only find out how much the folk of the Kirk love you when you've got some critical illness or some horrible misfortune. Flowers, messages of hope, offers of help come flooding in. Our love is often well hidden. I have a very leafy apple tree in my garden. You would think that it had no fruit at all, but it's there. I wonder if we hide our love under leaves of formality or shallow conversations. A love often only blossoms and flourishes in a crisis. I wish it wouldn't take tears to expose it. The Americans have a, a Pastor Appreciation Sunday, where gifts and nice words are said to their pastor. We'd be far too embarrassed in Scotland to do that. But the odd letter of thanks and encouragement wouldn't go amiss. In fact, it may well be treasured by the minister for a long time. Mark Twain said this, one compliment can keep me going for a whole month. He also said, a word of encouragement can change a child's life. Well, it can change an adult's life too. Loving comments and encouragements will produce fruitful lives. Have they love? Love is very powerful when expressed. The last question came from a captain of a submarine that was stranded at the bottom of the ocean. Have they hope? The Colossians were known for the fact that they showed great hope. Well, it was easy for them, some say, starting off a new church, all the excitement of seeing new folk coming to faith. But we're in different days now. The talk is about managing decline. And this coronavirus has not helped. Or has it? Are we losing hope? But what is the nature of hope? In normal usage, hope is a desire for something good. We say, we hope it happens, fingers crossed sometimes. But Christian hope is far stronger. It's a confident expectation of something good. Christian hope not only desires something good for the future, it expects it to happen. And it not only expects it to happen, it is confident that it will happen. There is a certainty that the good we expect and desire will be done. This is based on faith in the God that we've come to know through Jesus. He is a good God, and like a good parent, we can trust him to work for our best. What sent David Livingston to the heart of an unknown uncharted Africa? What motivated Mother Teresa to work among the poorest of the poor in Calcutta? What made George Muller set up orphanages in England for unwanted children? In each case, there was the hope that through faith in Christ, good would come. Livingston brought health and healing to what we call Malawi today. Mother Teresa brought the poor to the attention and support of the world. Muller so elevated homeless children that he was criticised for raising above them above their station in life. But he did it. Fruitfulness, love and hope change everything. May that be said of our lives too. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Lord, we remember that your word says, by their fruit you shall know them. So today, in kindness and goodness and love for you and the work of your kingdom, we give these our offerings, praying that through the mysteries of your ways they may produce a harvest of blessings for our world. 
Lord, use them that the hungry may be fed, the naked clothed, the lonely visited, the sick healed, the grieving comforted, and those without hope be given the opportunity to hear the good news of Christ. We ask it for his sake. Amen. Now let us make our prayers of intercession for others. Let us pray. Our God, who is our Saviour and Redeemer, we come to pray for our world, our church and our lives, knowing that you are able to answer our prayers and in ways beyond all we could ask or think. We pray for nations which are overwhelmed by the coronavirus, remembering especially Brazil, India and many third world countries which do not have health services which can cope. We pray for those who can do nothing to help the sick and whose families are left with no support. Lord, have mercy. Rid the world of this killer disease. Enable the scientists to produce a vaccine more quickly. And may the rich nations be willing to share what they have with those who would struggle to pay for such a lifeline. We thank you for our health services and all who work in them and all who have worked and sacrificed to do so much that others may simply live. Thank you for so many who have volunteered to help a neighbour and help run so many essential services. Lord, may our nation recognise the real worth of those who have done so much for us in this pandemic. We rejoice that in Scotland so few have died in recent times, and thank you for the efforts of all to achieve this. We pray for the churches in our land. So many still closed for worship, but yet many having discovered a new congregation through social media. Lord, thank you for this opportunity that the Muir and Relief churches have to share the good news with so many. We pray that the services would encourage, enlighten and enliven all who watch them and that they may be helped to encounter the God who loves them and so with faith enable them to face life's challenges with greater assurance and confidence. We pray for those on holiday just now for rest and recuperation after this long time of lockdown. We remember those in Spain who must return to self-isolate and pray for understanding from employers and patients for those who have to obey the rules. We remember that schools will be restarting soon and Pray for a smooth and worry-free start to term and for the ability of teachers and other adults to stay safe. We remember now all known to us who have special challenges, operations to face, recovery from treatments, changes to work routines, loss of employment, struggles with finances, fears of leaving the home, mental health issues, loss of physical health or loss of loved ones. Lord, you are the healer, the game changer, the miracle worker, the redeemer, the peacemaker, the God who can be trusted to get us through all that faces us. So come to all who are anxious today and let them know that with you they will be helped. Help us all today to do your will and to build a better world in which to live. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Two closing matters to intimate. In each church, we continue to have private prayer available in the sanctuary at Muir. That is on a Tuesday between 2 and 3 p.m. And at Relief, it's on a Thursday in the sanctuary between 2 and 3 p.m. also. We would be more than glad to see anybody who wishes to come along and join us for prayer at these times. Now let us move to our closing hymn.
And now the benediction. Eternal God and Father, by whose power we are created and by whose love we are redeemed, guide and strengthen us by your Holy Spirit, that we may give ourselves to your service and live this day in love for one another and for you. And so may the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, be known in all of your hearts and all of your homes throughout this day and always.